Okay, so today we're talking about ROM hacks. ROM hacks are modified versions of existing games that have some... They're modified. That's all there is to it. It doesn't matter what that modification is. Like, there's a bunch of different, like, types of ROM hacks that fit into that umbrella of ROM hack. So, at its basis level, a ROM hack is a patch that can be applied to a... to an older game, a ROM. So, you know, you have Super Mario World, you have a ROM of Super Mario World, and you apply a patch to it, and then you have this new modified version with new levels or another character or whatever. And that, like, patched version is referred to as a ROM hack, generally. Alright, so this video is basically just going to be me talking about all the different types of ROM hacks and cover different games, talk about some of my favorite, and just give my thoughts on what, like, the whole process, the whole, like, medium of ROM hacks. So, we'll first talk about translations. Now, I don't need to do too much explaining for translation. Translations are, you know, a game releases in Japan, but it never gets a release in English. There's no English... There's no English version of it. So a game gets released in Japan, but it never comes out in English. So there's this game that exists. You know, maybe you can play it, but you can't understand the words that are being said in it. Fire Emblem is a series that it only really caught on in the West around the GameCube slash Game Boy era. I remember with the um, Martha and Roy, those were put into Smash Melee as like a kind of like hyping up the new Fire Emblem game, but as also kind of like a callback to the, as it, Fire Emblem has been a series going on for long before the Game Boy. I'm pretty sure the first game was on the original Nintendo, but they just never came over to the West. They always stuck in Japan. So with fan translations, you can, some person out there, some random dude can translate that game on his own. He can download a copy of that Japanese game or he can rip his own copy. So some guy, some some random dude out there, can buy a copy of the Japanese game, rip it from that cartridge, from the chip, put it on his computer and manually translate all the words and all that. And then he can release a patch of everything in English. And you can apply it to that Japanese game. And then you're basically just playing it in English. So... Translations come from that, like, fan effort of, oh, there's this game I like, or there's this game that I know people like, but it never came over to the West. There's this whole, there's this whole market for this game that they never got to play. You know, Trials of Mana, that was a game that was legendary. It was only released in Japan, just like uh, the older Fire Emblem. A lot of games released in Japan, but never came over, obviously. Trials of Mana, it was, it's an SNES JRPG. Well, I've been saying Trials of Mana, it was actually called Seiken Densetsu 3. Seiken Densetsu 3 is a sequel to Seiken Densetsu 2, which was, that did come over in the West, and that was called Secret of Mana. So if you know your JRPGs, Secret of Mana got a sequel in Japan, but that never came over to the West. And it kind of got this reputation of being like, this really, really good JRPG. Like, one of the best on the console. And that's saying something if you know your RPGs on the console. And it just, it sucks that it never came over. But a fan translation of Seiken Densetsu 3 came over, so people could finally play this game that they didn't have access to before. And, you know, they could download the Japanese version, but part of the... Part of the enjoyment of these older RPGs is getting invested in the story. And, you know, so you can understand, and you read the HUD and you see all these mechanics. But if you're playing in a language you can't understand, none of that sinks in. I guess we obviously need to talk, if we're talking about fan translations, I have to bring up Mother 3. That's a game that's... How do I introduce Mother 3 if you, like, if nobody's ever heard of it, how do I convey the reputation this game has? I think if you were to ask any random game knowledge haver, what's the most popular game that came out in Japan but didn't come out into English, they would say Mother 3. That's been like the holy grail of like wanting an English release. 
and I think that's only because it got a very popular fans translation back in the day. I don't know how many years ago, or again, if it was a team or just one person, but through that, through that fan translation, people were able to play this game and realize, holy crap, there's something good going on here. Now, there's something to be said about if it's a fan translation, there's something, there's some, there's some, like, personal interpretation that goes into translation and, like, localization. Localization is where it's kind of different, or it's like, it's like a subsect of translation. Localization is like trying to take these, like, there's the literal Japanese words on the screen. But you kind of have to make it, rewrite it, and, you know, any cultural stuff, you might have to retranslate and, like, completely reword to have it make sense in English to, like, an English person's English-speaking person's sensibility. So localization, there's like this weird, this whole like cultural knowledge about the language and like idioms and stuff like that. There's something to be said about like, with the fan translation, you're subject to one person's interpretation. So I'm sure, I don't know a lot about, uh, I studied Japanese a tiny bit, not enough to where I was like reading. I don't know how much interpretation there is for like, any given sentence. So maybe one person can read it and take a completely different tone, or... I guess even beyond that, you know, people can just... If the person translating Mother 3 didn't really care so much, he just kind of wanted it to be funny, didn't really care for the serious side, that's, that'd be a very different Mother 3 than if someone who kind of respected the funny side but really, really was interested in the serious stuff. You know, you, that's like two different games at that point. You have a script that kind of that's kind of funny and lighthearted, and then you have one that's like really, really heavy, and that's something that's interesting about fan translations. You're at the whim of the creator, of the translator, of the fan creating it. When it comes to like official translations, I I, I don't have much insight into this, but I feel like the the creator of the game themselves, they have a lot of insight into like okay, should you do this? Should you take this creative liberty with this joke so it makes more sense in English? That's that's a whole thing. Maybe for another video I'll talk about like localization and translation. But for this, I just want to talk about at the very least getting to play a game and reading text in a game you might not have otherwise. So yeah. And then the next like sub section of translations are retranslations of released games. This is kind of like this is where a fan acknowledges that there's some, like, there's something in the official translation of a game that they don't like, and they fix it. They they put their own, like, spin on it. So the first thing I thought of when I think of this, when I thought of this, like, subsection, I don't know if this has been done, but I think of Ace Attorney. Ace Attorney had this big... When the first game came out, I think it came out on... Game Boy? I don't know if it came out in the Game Boy, there was a Game Boy in Japan, and then it came out on the DS whenever the DS came out. I don't know. But Ace Attorney, it started out as famous, like, famously. It was a, uh, like a very traditional Japanese game, but when they translated it, when the English localizers were making it, they tried to, like, retrofit it into being an American, like, setting. So these are like Japanese lawyers in the original game. Japanese lawyers takes place in Japan and all that. But when they were writing it into English, you're like, no, this takes place in America. These are American people. They speak American. And that kind of resulted in some weird stuff. What's the big thing? Was it a... I'm trying to think. There was a meme about it. Oh, it was like a... Eat your hamburger. And... But they they were holding like a jelly donut. No, not a jelly donut. <laughs> I'm mixing up my references here. Rice cakes in the original Pokemon series were referred to as jelly donuts. And in Ace Attorney, I'm pretty sure they referred to rice cakes as hamburgers. I got those two mixed up. At some point, it was easy to get away with, you know, like, oh, it takes place in America. It doesn't, it's not a big deal. But the later games really leaned into, like, Japanese culture. So they were really, like... Later games, it still took place in, like, that same... Like, all oh, these are Americans. 
So the translators had to really like push the boundary and be like, well, we can do this kind of as a... I, I, this is my like third party recounting of what I thought happened. I don't know if there's any, uh, there's actually been like a ROM hack translation to fix that stuff. But I feel like that's something that would have been. I'm assuming there is. There has to be. It kind of gets at the core of what I mentioned earlier, where there's like, where there will be sometimes interpretations taken to, you know, make stuff make sense to an American or the the new audience. You want it to make sense to this new audience in their culture. But a lot of people that play games are interested in like, no, if, it, if Ace Attorney takes place in Japan, just translate the, the dialogue. Don't make it. Don't change the characters like heritage and like the environment and all that. Some people aren't interested in that and more power to them for that. Fire Emblem Fates is another one I remember hearing about. That got a like a retranslation because I'm pretty sure that got a lot of when that game was being released in English. It had a lot of like jokes and stuff and was like kind of had some cringy humor and people weren't happy about that. So some people developed like a I don't even know if you'd call it like a translation or just like a rewriting of the English script. I guess they might have had to look at the original script. They just kind of removed those jokes, made it a little bit more serious. Kind of tried to bring it in tone with the rest of the other games. That That's interesting. That's like an interesting perspective on it. It's like, okay, there's the official version of, you know, Fire Emblem Fates where these characters are wacky and making silly jokes or whatever. But someone can prefer this, like, fan version that takes all that stuff out and makes it deadly serious. It's an interesting perspective on how there's, like, two different versions of the same game. I guess I'll kind of get into something about that later. Uh, the next subsection is play newer versions of a game with the old script. That's kind of like a weird thing to say out loud, but the best example is... Eventually, Final Fantasy VI came out on the Game Boy Advance. And when that happened, they redid the script. They changed around some stuff, you know, they retranslated it, as I understand it. And when they did that, they created two versions of the same game. You know, just like I just talked about with Fire Emblem Fates. There's two Final Fantasy VI's, not just in terms of, like, gameplay additions and stuff for the Game Boy Advance version, but, like, script differences and that's these are two different games at that point and I, there's ROM hacks where you can play the Game Boy version with the SNES script or you could play the SNES version with the Game Boy script so you can kind of you know pick your poison really you know if you prefer the artwork of the Super Nintendo or the Game Boy the presentation of one or the other you don't have to choose like you don't have to say, oh, I don't like the script of this version, but I like the visuals of the other. You can merge them with a ROM hack. You know, someone just copied all the text, put it into a patch, and you can patch your copy. And this next one is kind of related to the first two I talked about, but access to games you've played before, but on a newer platform. So I guess with the Final Fantasy VI on SNES and Game Boy, imagine if that Game Boy version never came out in English. I think it had some, like, mechanical stuff, like some mechanical uh, balancing, and I think it had, like, a new dungeon, maybe? Imagine that Game Boy version never came out in English. And that was, like, I don't know if it is or not, but just imagine that's, like, the definitive version of Final Fantasy VI. That would be terrible. I mean, it's great that that, like, good version exists, but English-speaking players don't have access to it. So what people would do is just take that version, and either throw on the old script or retranslate it, whatever. Dragon Quest 1, 2, and 3. These came out on the Nintendo Entertainment System. But then in Japan, they uh, they remade it with the Game Boy Color? The original Game Boy? Game Boy Color? I don't know. They were remade for those whatever handheld console that was, but it never came out in English. So while you might have played Dragon Quest or... I guess Dragon Warrior, Dragon Warrior 1, 2, and 3 on the Nintendo, that's like an inferior version to the Game Boy Color or whatever version. But that's not in English. You know, I, I played a little bit of 1 and 2 on the Game Boy Color, and 
It was much more enjoyable. I hate playing NES games. I hate playing NES games. Oh my god, I hate the... Uh, I shouldn't say that. I hate playing NES RPGs. They're so rudimentary and they don't have a lot of quality of life stuff. It's always just a... They always, like, add quality of life features in later. Like, entries into series that started out in the NES. And, like, uh, remakes of NES RPGs. They always add quality of life stuff that makes me hate going back and playing the original. And that's kind of what happened with Dragon Quest 1 and 2. I much prefer playing the Game Boy version of those, but it's not in English. So it's either... I have an NES cartridge of Dragon Warrior 1 in my room, but I would never play that. I hate NES RPGs. I would very much rather play the Game Boy. There's not much to say about that, it's just kind of like a retranslation of an existing game, but it's one that was on another platform already. Kind of weird, but I think that's... I really like that, getting access to updated versions of a game I already know. Alright, so we're leaving the land of translations and getting into the world of quality of life changes. Now this can be a few type, few different things. I guess there's like the simple ones, like the very, they just like fix bugs. You know, I, there was a, uh, I remember there was a patch for Final Fantasy Tactics on the PSP. Or the base game, it has slowdown or something when you use spells. So there's, you can just download a patch that removes that slowdown. It's as simple as that. It doesn't affect any other stuff. There's no other mechanical changes, none of that. Just fix this one hyper-specific problem. And I'm sure there's uh, other patches where it's like, oh, here's a bunch of generic bug fixes or tweaks to make it a little bit nicer. And then there's kind of more broad quality of life patches like uh super mario land dx on the game boy like super mario land was a uh was on the original game boy and there it was like a black and white or green and black i guess but super mario land dx that's a patch that like adds color to it so you get color and i don't know if there's any other features to that but what stuck out to me is that you know they added color to this game that was originally only in black and white uh, Sonic 3 Complete, that's a game that adds a ton of, like, it doesn't add any new content, it just serves to complement the base game. So there's, like, a level select, and you get to, get to choose level order, because, like, different regions or something have, like, different level orders. And you can change how Sonic moves, or he does, like, a spin dash from an older game, or he can do a certain move from an older game. There's a ton of, like, stuff to tweak. Sonic 3 to make it your favorite version. I really like that stuff. I love having like little toggles and stuff for quality of life or moves that were in previous games but not in the new one. Love stuff like that. Which kind of segues into small additions, those types of ROM hacks. This I feel like is the most broad version. Because when I first think of this, I think of new characters being added to a game. You know, Sonic the Hedgehog on the Gen the Genesis Sonic games. Those must have... There must be thousands of patches for Sonic the Hedgehog 1, 2, and 3 that add just, like, a new character or add a new sound or something. I think of, that's my game I think of when I think of, like, games with, like, a robust ROM hacking scene where people just make a character. You know, here's Amy. You can play Sonic the Hedgehog 2 as Amy. Because why not? Or it'll be Shadow or... Just whatever character. And they'll have maybe they'll have their own moves. Maybe they'll play exactly like Sonic and it'll just be like a palette swap. It just adds like one tiny little thing. Uh Ultimate Mortal Kombat trilogy. That's uh it basically just adds all the characters from the older Mortal Kombat games into the new one. That's that's all there is. Like new stages and some sound stuff, but simple. There's not a lot it's not like fundamentally changing the game. As for fundamentally changing the game, we have completely new experiences. These are the biggest in scope. There's some that bring like new balancing to the game and like how you play it. Final Fantasy VI Brave New World, I'm pretty sure that's just like a rebalancing of the combat to make it more difficult. It just makes it more difficult. There might be new content and stuff, I'm not sure. Maybe correct me in the comments, I don't know. You know, even if I'm wrong with that, there's a ton of other games that, uh, it's like patches that just balance the game around a new... Give it like a new twist. 
Pokemon Crystal Clear is a ROM hack of Pokemon Crystal that makes it open world. So in Pokemon Crystal and most other Pokemon games, you progress through the world and then you get to a point where you're like, okay, I gotta go back and beat the uh, gym leader for that region, and then I can progress forward until I hit another roadblock. But with Crystal Clear, it's all open from the start, and Pokemon and wild areas, they scale to your level. Is that true? Or are they all set? I can't remember. I know gym leaders at least scale to your level. So you could take on the gym leaders in whatever order you like. And that that gives the game a whole new it's a whole new perspective on a game that's mostly the same. So it's still the same assets, it's still the same Pokemon, it's still the same world. But you're playing it in a completely different way. That's fascinating. It's it's like a I played Pokemon Crystal a lot in my childhood. But playing this, it's it's so bizarre seeing every seeing stuff I know. But there's this twist on it that's like, oh, I look at the world in a completely different way. And this game becomes a whole new experience, even though it's technically still the same. It's great. I, I love those types. Th those are great. And then at the far, far end of the spectrum, you know, we go from like tiny patches that fix little bugs to completely new everything. Like, there's an infinite number of Super Mario World ROM hacks that just add, like, a ton of new levels. An insane number of Pokemon ROM hacks that add new Pokemon, regions, characters, everything. It's literally a new game at that point. You know, I'm sure if you went to the, uh, Pokemon Fire Red page on, uh, romhacking.net, I think that's the URL. If you went to that page, there would be so many, just, so many creative ROM hacks of people making their own regions and, like, their own lore and story. That's insane to me. It's insane that people can make... Some, like, one person can make a new region. And so and one person can make their own sequel to Super Mario World. While I think that stuff is cool and all, is that something I want to put my time into? It's weird, because part of the joy for me in playing a game is participating in the community discussion of it. You know, I play a game and then I like going on YouTube and watching challenge videos or reviews or whatever about a game. And you know, if I were to go in and type a Pokemon Fire Red challenge, Pokemon Fire Red review, there's a ton of videos. But if I type in Pokemon Unbound review challenge video, there's nothing. Not nothing, r rather, there's a lot less. Given, like, these are all, like, splinters off one game. You know, you think about, there's the base game, Pokemon Fire Red, and there's so many branching paths of, like, every single individual ROM hack, and, like, each community is splintered off from each other. So, you know, Pokemon Unbound, that's the one I've been playing a little bit recently. That community is completely isolated from every other Pokemon ROM hack. You know, I play Pokemon Crystal Clear, and it's like, these are two separate... I mean, obviously they're different games, but... The disparity of discussion and just, like, raw information in those games, compared to the original game itself, it's, it's just staggering. You know, in a game like Pokemon, that's something where I want information. You know, people from the community, they... They really know how to compile, like lists and guides and things about like how to best play the game or how to find this character or this item. Pokemon is such a popular series where people will document that stuff. And thankfully the Pokemon ROM hacking scene is pretty big, so most of the time you'll find some documentation, but it's not as nearly as neatly documented. Or maybe it's out of date and only applies to an older version. It's kind of like that splintering off of communities into smaller communities into smaller communities. It's It just... It kind of puts me off from playing them at all. Because I, uh, I was playing Pokemon Unbound, and I'm like, this is a cool game. I guess I should clarify. Pokemon Unbound isn't... It's a new region, but there's no new Pokemon. Well, the, like, the thing they did for the Pokemon there is they added older... Er, 
newer Pokemon into Pokemon Red. So I think it goes up to Kalos. So Pokemon Fire Red, that's Gen 3. I think they pulled all the way from like Gen 6, maybe? Gen, I don't know, my Pokemon generations. They made new sprites for newer Pokemon that were never in this older art style. So I was like, screw it. I'm just going to collect every Pokemon. But then I go on to like, like, okay, if I were to do this, what's the documentation like online to help me get through that? And there's some stuff, but I just wish it was better. And I can't fault, you know, the developer or the community for that. You know, it really takes... Whenever you find some, like, really well-documented game or something like that, it's usually a result of, like, really, really passionate people. And for a game as big as Pokemon Fire Red or whatever, that has a lot of fans, so there's a much like much higher likelihood that some really passionate person will be drawn to this game and, you know, make write up a whole guide on how to do catch every single Pokemon or something like that. But when the community is a lot smaller, there's a lot smaller of a chance that it'll have these that this one super passionate person will be drawn to the game and make a whole wiki about it or I don't know. It's something that I go back and forth on. Like, I kind of like Crystal Clear in that it's mostly the same game as Pokemon Crystal. In that, you know, it's all the same Pokemon, it's all the same levels, all the same moves. But it's just like quality of life stuff to make you play in a different way. Pokemon Unbound is like a completely different beast. And I don't know. I don't know. It just seems like a weird thing to put my time into. But I guess if I enjoy my time playing a game, there's not like... I shouldn't regret it. Even if it's a game, like, a magnitude less people know about. Like, there's no shame in that. I don't That's something I'll have to think about on my own time, about, like... I like Pokemon Unbound well enough. But will I beat it? I don't know. It's just a personal thing on my end. I don't... I can at the very least say I'm glad this, like, art form exists. Because it is, like, an art form. The fact that ROM hacking exists, it's like a canvas... For people to turn their, like, this existing artwork, this existing game, and, like, remix it and make changes to it to make it their own. It's, it has a much lower barrier to entry than making a fan game, I think. I don't actually know. I think there's kind of, like, this, at least in the, like, realm of fan games, I think there's, there's this charm of taking a game, an existing game you like, you really like, and putting your own twist on top of it. So, like, would Pokemon Crystal Clear be as charming as it is if it was made in its own engine and, like, had a completely different feel to the original Pokemon Crystal in terms of, like, movement and animations? There's a charm that comes from, like, the restrictions of the console it was developed for. And I think that's kind of lost when there's, like, a, you know, it's like a fan engine trying to recreate the feel of a, an older game engine. Sometimes I can be pulled off, but it's really difficult to to match that. And it's it's just easier to, you know, rework the existing older game and then just release a patch so people can play it on their own copy. And the sheer fact that ROM hacking allows for, like, allows you to play a game that already existed, but you just didn't speak the language gives you access to that game and you get to have a have a similar experience to someone like across the world that's beautiful that's beautiful that you know Seiken Densetsu 3 Mother 3 passionate fans took these games that were beloved in their own region and brought them to a completely new demographic and new new market and Seiken Densetsu 3 that eventually got an English release Trials of Mana. I think that only happened because of how popular the fan translation was. You know, maybe Square Enix would have released it anyway. But I remember watching the E3. I talked about this in a video, actually. I forget which one it was. I think it was about emulation. But I talked about, like, I saw this at E3. I was like, oh my gosh, this is insane. 
I can't believe this is happening because Seiken Densetsu had been a thing for so many years. It got so big in like the JRPG culture. And then Square Enix is like, yo, we hear you. Here it is in English. And I don't know how well that game sold. I feel like that's a big thing. It's like, okay, Seiken Densetsu 3 has a fan translation. You can download it for free. People don't like to talk about it, but you can download Seiken Densetsu 3 for free. Download the free ROM patch and just put it on there and play it. Or you can buy the collection of mana on the Switch for $40. So there was this weird, like, conundrum of like, okay, people love this game, but are they going to buy it again? Are they going to buy the collection of mana just to play? I mean, it is a collection. You know, there was a Seiken Densetsu 1 and 2, but those were initially released in English. Seiken Densetsu 3, Trials of Mana. That's like the main hook of this collection. Is there still value in that after a fan translation has been available for so many years? You know, I think about Mother 3. I've seen a lot of people say, you know, why do you want Nintendo to make an official translation of Mother 3? The fan translation already exists. People love that. Why should Nintendo try and like... Like, what's the point in Nintendo trying to capitalize on it if people have already played the game and they like it? I don't know. I think there's just value in like... Like, there's the core fan base of people that... Of the people that are gonna, like, find ROMs for a game and then install a patch onto that ROM to then play it in an emulator, that's like a very dedicated group of fans. Those are like diehard fans. Honestly, those people are probably gonna buy the game again. But the real value comes from, you know, that game being shown to like a vast audience. So Mother 3 is like, it's taken this... I think Mother 3 is, the, is like the one game that's stepped out of this... This niche of like fan translations has kind of become like a cultural meme on like Reddit and Twitter. You know, it'll get like thousands of retweets talking about Mother 3. But a lot of smaller games, you know, I think those hardcore fans are the people who support that stuff. And they, they give those games the credit they deserve even if, you know, fans gave... Mother 3 a chance when Nintendo wouldn't let him. And I don't know what to make of that. You know, Reggie fils he... He was badgered for so many years about Mother 3, and he never budged on it. I have to wonder if it was a Nintendo... Like, the Japanese side of Nintendo not wanting to do it rather than the American side. Because I feel like there's such a huge demand, there has to have been, like... Like, why didn't they do it? What was holding him up? I don't know. There must have been some crazy internal stuff, because there was a huge... They parodied the Mother 3, like, fan stuff at E3. That blew my mind that that happened. They mentioned Mother 3 in an E3 presentation in, like, a robot chicken animation style. So it was that popular, but it never got popular enough for them to release a English version. Bizarre. I think I've rambled enough. Uh, as always, leave a comment, a uh, suggestion for a future video. That's all there is to say. Yeah. Bye. Bye. What? Bye.